Uh, my name's T. Martin. Um, Michael Lewis, Sean Tui, and I were in a small high school class together. I don't think either of them needs much of an introduction. Uh, they all have so many, they both have so many accomplishments. Come on up here, you guys. But then Michael goes and does a book about Sean's life, which then becomes the highest grossing sports movie of all time. Uh, and I, there gotta be some other statistics about that movie because it's on the TV all the damn time. Uh, of course, Michael also wrote Liars Poker, Moneyball, The Big Short, Coach. Oh, Coach Fitz. Affected all of us. And more recently, The Premonition, where Michael pretty much predicted the pandemic. So he explains and predicts things a lot. In fact, Michael, I was informed that today, Michael, I was informed. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I was informed that today you, you are going to simply explain crypto to all of us. And <laughs> come back, Sean. And what the hell is going on at FTX, right? I heard that. That's not what we're doing. Okay. He's now, uh, he's got great podcasts and articles, always in the New York Times and Vanity Fair and on and on. His career has been nothing short of amazing. The three of us shared a stern English literature teacher named, that we love, Dr. Francis. She would not be completely surprised at Michael's best-selling success. No, not at you. No. And I don't think she would be terribly surprised that I wrote a book called In the Land of Cocktails. <laughs> I do think Dr. Francis would fall out of her chair to hear that Sean is a New York Times best-selling author. Should take uh, my F back, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sean and Leanne's book, In a Heartbeat, Sharing the Power of Cheerful Giving is a gift and a delight. It is so them, it is how they live. I am witness to that as Sean is on the board of the culinary school I chair called Noki. I never asked him for money, but a big chunk showed up one day. Recently, his wife Leanne asked me, uh, how much did Sean give you? <laughs> Just like that. And I told her a big no, fact. No, you didn't. <laughs> did you tell her? I did. I'm staying I, at your house tonight. <laughs> I told her a big fat number and she said, you should have asked me. <laughs> uh, that's a true that's, story. That's, that's true. And that is exactly who they are. That's that's but in true. my head, Sean is that adorable basketball player. Michael was the adorable baseball player building his own dugouts and things as I recall. Sean won two state basketball championships, and he says it would have been three if David Pointer hadn't gotten sick that one year. This is true. He got mom, mono. He kissed every girl in the high school. <laughs> My mom used to go watch them play when even I wasn't going because they were exciting to watch with all the no-look passes Sean had. In fact, he went on to play at Ole Miss and still holds SEC basketball rec records, including in the whole entire SEC, the most assists ever. Um, so even then, he was a giver. Um, that was reluctant. That, that was <laughs> I was not a cheerful giver then. He also call, calls the games for the Memphis Grizzlies, but what I want to tell you all, because you may not know about his restaurant career, Sean and I just met over at Picnic, a little spot Daryl Reginelli and I have over on Magazine. I think you liked the Smash Burger, didn't you? It was you? delicious. It was good, thank you. Um, we have one Picnic. Sean had 117 restaurants at one time. I just want you to let that sink in. Um, Taco Bells, KFCs, and Long John Silvers. When I once teased him about the Long John Silvers, he quickly reminded me how much money he made at the Long John Silvers. He can read a financial statement like most of us read a novel. I have been the head of the fan club for these two exceptional human beings for a long, long time. When I emailed them jointly a couple nights ago about this session, a highly unhelpful, completely ridiculous chain of emails ensued. So, I have absolutely no idea what they're gonna talk to you about today. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Sean Tui and Michael Luke. So, so the truth is I have no idea what we're gonna talk about either. The truth is I only came because of her. Yeah. <laughs> Not because of you. You know, it, you know, when I reconnected with Sean, it was now, what, 20 years ago. But between high school and the blind side, we had fallen out of touch. Uh, he said to me that he had not read a book 
since he graduated from high school. Well, no, I didn't finish a book. All right, you didn't finish a book. I think it really, look at this crowd. It kind of tells you something about the New Orleans Book Festival. Yeah, the good. least important word in that title is book. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? So, so I, I'm going to start. There, I want, there are a bunch of things. I'm going kind of, to leave this because if I let you lead it, I don't know where you're going to take it. Uh, but uh, in the title of the, we start, we'll start with when we reconnected. Um, and then we're going to go back to New Orleans. Um, but I was, this would have been 2003. I was invited to Memphis to give a talk about Moneyball, a book that just come out. I was in the process of writing an article for the New York Times Magazine, which became a book about Billy Fitzgerald, our high school coach. And I thought, going to Memphis, I knew Sean was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I had to check my memory about some things. Don't always like to do it, but I knew Sean would also have good stories. So I get in touch with Sean, and he says, I'll pick you up at the airport. Remember this? So I really had not seen him in a very long time. 26 years. Whatever, almost. I think you went to Princeton, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Except, yeah. He, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so he picks me up, and there's a little chit-chat, but it's almost the first thing out of his mouth is, and he's quite matter-of-fact about it, he says, so who writes your books? <laughs> and, and he's driving, I'm, and I look at him, I said, he, I said, Are you I said Sean, Sean, I write my books. And he says, you know, he says, I know you're really good at promoting them. I see on TV, like you just like, you sell them well, I really admire that, but who actually puts the words on the page? And I said, Sean, I, I put the words on the page. And he looks at me, he goes, no, you don't. I said, I'm trying to do your act. No, you don't. You're a dumbass just like me in the back of Dr. Francis's class. He, I, I think to this day, he has questions about whether there is not in my house a basement filled with little gremlins or generating the words. It's definitely under suspicion. <laughs> I haven't completely bought in. You, you know, Michael, pe people who I meet, kind of take a while and they come back like three days later and say, you know Michael Lewis? I go, yeah, you know, I do. You know, and they said, how do you know with him? How, how do you know him? And I went through the whole thing and they said, you know, how did he know to do this book? I said, well, I should sleep with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good starter. <laughs> I go, I was six. We were in kindergarten together. Chill out a little bit. Where's your mind? <laughs> and you know, they go, oh, he's just so great, just so great. And, you know, Michael was actually a very, very, very good athlete. He was a great baseball player. And, you know, no one really cares about that, but that's, that was my connection. I, w I wouldn't have seen him in school. 13 years, only 60 kids in the class. If he hadn't played baseball, we, would never, we never had the same class together, is basically what I'm telling you. And, and, and it was hard for me. I mean, he was always sharp and blah, 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 but I knew him as, as the meathead baseball player who broke his nose because he couldn't get to the line ball, dr line drive at time. And so it, it did amaze me. No, that was sincere. I really meant that, 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 that there's, you know, there was no way you were doing that. <laughs> and they say now, oh, he's just fabulous, fabulous. And I go, you know, we didn't see it in high school, but, but he really is. And so I guess if you tell me you wrote it, I'll believe you. Well, well, so this, you're, he's not wrong in that there was no sign that I... Trust me, there was no sign. No sign. No, no, I don't, think, I don't think anybody who went to school with us would have had too much of a different reaction, except you had the balls to say it. Well, you know, and, I don't think anybody at our school would have had the balls to think that you and I would be on this stage together. No, that's true, too. <laughs> representing <laughs> literary stuff. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Francis, who we all had for English class, my, I mean, my last memory of Dr. Francis is being thrown out of her class. I got a C minus You're in a religion genius and, and a D in biology that year. But yeah. I, that my memory of Dr. Francis, I mean, it was a kind of a turning point, but it wasn't the intentional one. It wasn't I learned how to write in Dr. Francis's class. I was, you know, she was tough, right? And I can remember, I thought I was so witty. Um, at some point in the middle of the class, she stopped me for like disrupting the class or not doing my work. And I looked up and in front of everybody said, I said, Dr. Francis, are you always so pleasant to be with or is this just an especially good day for you? <laughs> and, and it was like, nope, 
go to the headmaster. And, I, and this was a moment because I went, it, it, it was after, it was, Teddy, Teddy Catonio was a headmaster. And, so Michael and I and T went to Newman, just to give you a background. Yeah. They, they paid, my daddy coached there, so I went free. We're going to talk so about your dad. Different paths. Yeah. Um, but we had some very good administrators and coaches at Newman. And Teacher, he, teachers, too, but Miss Catonia was a And he gave me a long talk about my life, and where I was going to end up if I didn't clean myself. And that moment, that was Dr. Francis' contribution. To, I, he kind of, I was kind of scared straight. Well, good for her, then. So I, we're going to get to the blind side. Because and how we got to the blind side. Well, we, we start. You want to start there? We start. When well, we start there. So, can right. you pick me up at the airport? I, I you take me to your house. Uh, I'm amazed how well you've done for yourself. Try. You know, it wasn't really that are. I didn't. In fact, I, it, it didn't. The truth is, it, if I'd known nothing, I knew you'd done real well in life. Um, I, I'd have known you were going to do real. Well. I mean, there was never any question. I, I tell one. I, mean, I disagree with that, but keep going. I'll let you go. So, so Sean had. Um, I would tell the story behind your back, so it's going to sound like I'm blowing smoke, but it's actually, I've told this story before. Sean, by the time I was in the ninth grade, was a character in my imagination. He's, he, I'd watched him, I'd, you know, we played basketball together through middle school, we played baseball together. We slept school. together. We slept together. I used to spend the night at your house. A lot. Loved your daddy. Um, and I, so this is a story that captures the spirit of how I thought of Sean uh, and his dad. Um, we'd been on a, high school, a middle school basketball team that went like 64-1. and one. I'd watched him just take over every situation he walked into. And he wasn't always the most physically talented person. He just had an un, unbelievable competitive streak and an incredible ability to win. Uh, and everything. I mean, you'll compete with me in this conversation, right? And I'll win. You'll win, right. So he, and, and, I mean, he's just like as the most... When, we played against you all the time, you know it. Yeah, so, so um, we were freshmen, and uh, the, he, w he was on the varsity basketball team, but he was on the, he, Ed was starting, his brother, older brother was starting, mm -hmm. they were in the state playoffs, they got to, I don't know, quarters of the semis, and they're playing in, um, in the Baton Rouge. Alexandria, Louis. Right, the, that big gym, it was, you know, it was a college gym. And I drove up with a friend who, who actually didn't know Sean at all, it was just a friend who wanted to go see Newman play basketball. We drove up and we sat up in the rafters. And this, Newman was down by two points with you know, eight seconds left on the clock. And Sean was on the bench. Uh, and I said, turn to my friend, I said, watch. His dad's going to put Sean in. And sure enough, your dad, I don't know who he took out. I, I still want, whoever he took out of the game. The ball's on the wrong end of the court. And I said, watch. Sean's got this. They gave the ball to Sean, he dribbles through five people, pulls up at half court, and it's nothing but net. And you hadn't really been on, I don't know if you've been on the court at that point. And I remember, I remember just thinking, I've just watched that thing happen so often. It's like when you used to watch Michael Jordan, it was like that. It's, I mean, the level of athleticism is different. I'm glad I came. No. <laughs> The level of I only came to see T, but no, this no, 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 great. This is, but this is absolutely true. Keep it up. The level of athleticism was different, but that thing, that gene, that thing it, to, to like walk into a moment and figure it out and have ice water in your veins, it was very clear to me that whatever happened to Sean, it was going to be good. Uh, and so it wasn't surprising to me. It wasn't surprising to me that you'd been a big success. I thought, well, that's, that's, that's kind of how this world works. So Sean, Sean wins. Tell him what you really said when Leanne came to the door. I can't believe how pretty she is. No, you can't believe how pretty she is and that she married you. Yeah, well, that, well that, What's that's the a, quote. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> that's, that's a whole different subject. And um, uh, so we, I spent a little time with you at your house. And my memory is that... Uh, there was a six foot five inch, 300 pound black kid on your sofa, and you never really explained what he was doing there. And, and, and on, the way, on the way back, I said, Sean, who was he? And, and, and that was the very beginning of the blind side story, that you'd taken him in because he didn't have a home. And I, I didn't, I don't want to end this interview, but I didn't want to, I, the idea that this was going to be a book or I was ever write about it, I thought it was just interesting and moving that you'd taken him in. And you were the color commentary for the Memphis Grizzlies at the time. So mm -hmm. you came out to the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So we had excuses to get together. And we just started talking. Um, 
and this story just got more and more interesting and, and rich. And at the same time, okay, you can go ahead. Well, no, I just never thought it was a very interesting story. <laughs> oh, come uh, on. I, you know, when you look at it from my perspective, it, it's, it's not humbling because it's not humbling at all. It's almost embarrassing because I guarantee I could take one, a random row here and it's a better story than ours. So it's not like we earned what happened here. You know, you just chose to ruin our lives. <laughs> <laughs> In a big way. <laughs> he, he came to the door and my wife thought, we had tutors for Michael literally every hour for six hours. And she thought Michael, I mean, he's a nerd. I mean, you look at him. And she thought he was, she thought Michael Lewis was one of our, Michael's tutors. And she said, that's why she put him on the couch, like, you're up next. <laughs> and I came home and I said, did Michael Lewis come? She says, who's Michael Lewis? I said, classmate, you know, blah, 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 Big Arthur. And she said, no. And I said, well, actually, he's right there. She <laughs> said, oh, I thought he was a tutor. I said, great. <laughs> this is starting off exactly the way I wanted to. <laughs> Well, you know, but the rest of it was right. You said you walked out and said, "Okay, who's the big black kid?" And I mean, yeah. and I'm going, oh, "I didn't see one." <laughs> and, and he said, "No, like he walked through the house like he lives there." I said, "He does live there." And then he, I, said, I wasn't answering any of his questions, not to be difficult. I just didn't see the relevance of it, much like we didn't see the relevance of, of the movie. So it, it's I'm glad the movie did well. Um, we'll get to the movie. I'm glad you did well in the book, although it didn't really do that great. No. <laughs> um, but we really didn't have a part of it in the way of it developing... Into a thing. Into a thing. Right. And so our only ownership is post, um, because that's the value to us, is that you know, there is a platform now that it allowed us to have some relevance to that you know, we were already there, but now it's... You know, Leanne talks to her two million best friends every night on social media. Um, and, I, and one sat like two seats from me on the airplane get coming here, and it was creaky. What's that? The, one of her people. Oh, and, one of Leanne's people? Yes. I mean, you know, so did you like Disney World the other day? I went, did I go with you? And she says, no, but I, I saw it on Leanne's social media. Oh, went, God. Oh, God. <laughs> So, you know, I, I couldn't pick my nose the whole trip because then well, she so, was... So, um, the way this thing... But the, he, not only were they not looking for anybody to write about them, I wasn't looking to write about them either. I mean, I would, this thing went on for, I don't know, a year, year and a half. And, and this, the, the who put chocolate in my peanut butter yeah. moment, I remember this. Because, remember, I'd just written Moneyball. And I'm kind of thinking, I might want to do another sports book. I was asking, I was being invited by kind of general manager types to get to know their organizations of different sports. Uh, I had access to stuff, and I was talking to the guy who did all the, basically, the thinking for the San Francisco 49ers, and asking him, like, what's the equivalent of money ball in football? And he said, um, well, it really isn't the same thing because the payrolls are the same. They're capped, and, you know, we aren't, it isn't a rich team versus a poor team kind of situation. However, he said, it's really interesting the difference from team to team and how they distribute the payroll across the roster. Like, how much do you pay for the, spend on a quarterback versus a cornerback versus a linebacker? And he pulled out this, you know, reams of data showing what had happened in various, to various positions in the NFL since free agency, since there was an open market for this stuff. And he showed that, like, one position had gone from lowest paid to second highest paid, and it was the left tackle. On, on the offensive line, and it was because that left tackle protected the right-handed quarterback's blind side and stopped people from the most expensive thing from getting hurt. He was a very fancy insurance policy. And then he started to explain that, like, at, since this thing had gotten so valuable, there was a, it, it emerged there was a kind of a prototype for what made someone good at this. It was especially long arms, especially big hands. It was, a, it was a, sort of a, the elephant that who's a ballerina, incredibly nimble, large, all the rest. Now, meanwhile, Sean has in his house, and this was, after the fact, a lot of people were saying, oh, like, they knew this was a football player all along. I can remember Sean talking to me about, like, how we're going to manage 
the jump from high school to college. And I knew, we're going to get back to this, but it, this is partly a coaching story. I knew if Sean got a hold of him and, and turned him into a basketball player, it would work. Sean would figure out how to make him a junior college basketball player. Well, I was paying for his school, so I had to figure out how he could go free. Yeah. <laughs> And, and basketball, he was a great basketball player. He was a really good basketball really good player, basketball. but he didn't look like a basketball player. No, he, he, he was actually 6'5", 355 pounds. Right. And, and, but the fact that he was nimble on nimble. the basketball court. Smart. The whole and and, and that, so he was, that was the track he was on in his mind. And then you called me one day and said you never believe what's happened. And I think it was Nick Saban. Was that what happened? You, well, Tom mind? Lemming. And this well, is, this is the minutiae, but he does a big scouting service. He came through our school. Our school, Lily White private school, you've seen a million of them. Once in every 10 years, a kid will be half decent. So they stop in every once in a while. And Tom Lemmy stopped in and he said, blah, blah, blah. And the coach said, well, we got this big kid. He's no good, but he's big. And so they went out, you know, the next day for practice. And Tom Lemmy was there and he came in and he said, it's number one recruit in America. He hadn't even started on a football game much. I mean, he was like started half the years. This is his junior year. Yeah. And so our coach kind of laughed. He says, no, 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 really? He's going to be the number one recruit in the country. Well, he hadn't even gotten a letter. I mean, now you've, you've already committed and decommitted from seven schools by the right. time you're a junior. Right. And so the high school coach called me and said, we're in big trouble. <laughs> so I went, why? He said, Michael's the number one recruit in the country. I said, basketball? He says, no football. I said, there's no way. And so you're right. So I called Nick Saban, who there's a way story later that's actually more interesting than the blind side. <laughs> and so I said, Nick, Sean, I went through the whole thing. And he says, well, I didn't know anything about this. Like he was really upset that I'm just telling him now. I said, well, Nick, yesterday I didn't know anything about this either. <laughs> and so I was in Portland, Oregon with the Grizzlies doing a game and typical Nick you know, every letter, ADD, AHQ, QRST, he's got them all. And he's banging on the school door at 7 o'clock in the morning to go see this kid. And he goes in and they're playing preschool basketball out there. And there's Michael running down the court. And he turns to our football coach, takes him outside. He said, he's a junior, I can't talk to him. But that kid is going to be the number one recruit in the country. And we said, we just found that out. He says, he does play football, doesn't he? And they said, yeah. You know, we didn't think very well, but everyone else does. And he said, this is what Nick Saban said. And it's going to be about 20 seconds. So I'm going to steal, I am going to steal a video of 20 seconds. Go ahead, Nick. Everybody knows Nick Saban. And, and so he calls me. Now, it's 5 in the morning in Portland. And I go, hello. He says, Sean's Nick. I said, Nick, it's 5. He, he, didn't, even, he didn't even acknowledge it. He says, so here's what's going to happen to you. He says, this kid... He's going to go, he seems to be a regional kid, he's going to go to an SEC school. Nick was at LSU then, and he would have gone to LSU if Nick had stayed. Nick went to the Dolphins, so that kind of eliminated that. Um, and so, I'm almost people here probably didn't want to hear that, but I think that, I don't want to know. Michael chose his own school, but I think that's where he probably would have gone. And so, he said, in his freshman year, he'll start every game, he'll be freshman All-American. His sophomore year will be All-SEC, guaranteed. His junior year, he'll be a consensus first team all SEC. He'll be second team all American, and you're going to have to decide if he's going to go for the NFL draft. This kid hadn't gotten a letter from a college. Yet. He said, and if he stays, he'll be the consensus unanimous all American. He'll be up for the Outland Trophy, which is the most valuable lineman on either side of the football, and he's a guaranteed first round NFL draft choice. And I'm going to really credit Michael this because I, I take credit for it, but he's here and, and he'll, he'll bust me on it. That's the premise of the whole movie, we think. You know, what you guys think, I don't know. But, and it's it, a little emotional. If a kid like that can get passed over, he was out of school, he was flunking, he's a great kid, but, but he couldn't pass, and the school didn't want him, you know, God only knows what would happen. But if a kid like that can get passed over, who gets left behind? And that ruined our life. Yeah. The, you know, not his book. His book helped. The movie really did. But that did because it hit our consciousness. Because we walk past people all the time now. Yeah. And, you know, four days later, something bad happens to them. And we just look at ourselves and we go, you know, we, we could have done something. So... You know, what you did 
didn't help, and the movie really, really hurt. But what, what he did really, really ruined our lives because we, we had to have a conscience all of a sudden. And, and that's a bad thing to have. It really is because you, you, you feel bad. You, and so, and, and Michael Lewis is the one who said it. He, he said that if a kid like the most obvious success story walking the streets of Memphis, this is what Nick Saban said. There's not a more obvious success story walking the streets of Memphis. Well, I, I like that line, but Michael Lewis took it and said, imagine who gets left behind. The, the greatest doctor in the world. It could be better than David Weil, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe. He's saying maybe. Um, you know, but, but kids just need a chance. Yeah. And, and, you know, we didn't, he was 16, we didn't do it. We just gave him a house and some hope. And if kids get a house and a hope, a lot of things, a lot of good things can Yeah. So that's, that's a, so, so from my point of view, which I'm watching this, Sean is, it, it was, we had a dinner. We had a dinner with my wife, Tabitha, and. I paid. What's that? He's the cheapest human being you've ever seen in your entire life. I'm in Berkeley. Of course, I had to sign in because I wasn't far left Th that's enough. That's actually not true. I did have to sign in. It's just not true. I had true. to sign in at the city hall because they wanted I'll to make sure I was leaving. The they make sure I left. That's actionable. So, <laughs> so, so um, I'm in a very weird state of mind because, because he's told me about Nick Saban coming and saying what Nick Saban says. I've had this story told to me by them, and Nick Saban's saying this is a left tackle in the NFL. The story about this thing that's happened in NFL football has, has, has raised the value of this person. And it all came together as an idea really quickly, and that was the center of the idea. And the center of the idea was, was like, one, if someone so conspicuous as this can be passed over, who can't be? Uh, and two, it's a story that naturally organizes itself. It's odd because it's half family drama and half of NFL strategy, but it's like all the forces that are going to transform the value of this child and maybe the most important force is a loving family. Um, and I'm sitting on this thinking, I can't do this, it's Sean. You know, I mean, it's like, I, I've been following this with interest with absolutely no sense that like, I would write about it because it seemed like cheating. It's like sleeping with your sister. You know, it was just like, I grew up with you. I can't write a book about you. That's it's way worse when you sleep with your sister. <laughs> I'm just telling you, we you've gotta always get a, been. You got to get another analogy. That's not. A, that's not. <laughs> I got to get that one. Oh, no. That's so, horrible. <laughs> so, I so I thought I just can't do that. You know, like it's and so Tabitha listened to the story over the dinner, and I can remember her getting in the car with me afterwards, and she said, "Why you're writing about anything else?" And. And I, I can remember thinking, you know, that's right. I, the, the feelings I have in response to this story are so powerful uh, that that'll carry the day. And no, never mind that, like, it, it, it's very odd. No one knows who Michael Orr is. He's a kid in high school at that point, right? Uh, and yeah. it was the experience of writing about it was really interesting. One, because I got to then tap into, it was fun writing about you, because I get to tap into, like, what I remembered about you. And I could see the qualities that I knew of you as a kid being funneled and, your, and everything you learned by, by osmosis from your father uh, being channeled into this child. Um, and the book kind of wrote itself. And it is of, uh, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. It was just like Lawrence, Lawrence Taylor at the beginning. It just like all came together in a flash. It was, it was a, the joy to write. And I was so proud of it. And then it flopped. And then it came out, and you know it hit the New York Times bestseller list, but like it was going, come and gone. You know, it was it was the, easily, easily my least, my worst selling hardback book. Well, it wasn't any good. Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> it was a good book. I, it was okay. You called me. Well, now, now I know you never. It's, it's very funny. I did it, read it. You, well, I read our section. Yeah, it, yeah. It was. It, <laughs> now, now, what you did? No, I remember. <laughs> so it was like. NFL, about our family, NFL, it was like chapter, chapter. And so I figured that out by about the third chapter and I just skipped. Uh. So what I, so, so, um, yeah, so you, 
I didn't realize how little it meant when you called me and said it was the best book you ever read. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, Michael gets all mad because he said it didn't depict him right and this and that. I said, Michael, I, I lived with this kid for 13 years. I mean, every day of my life, and I'm reading the book, and it basically says that I was fat, bald, and stupid. And, and, and Michael kind of, I said, I know I'm only two of those. There's no way I'm that third one. <laughs> and I said, so, you know, that's, that's, you know, everybody takes it so serious, but. Yeah. It, well, you, in the moment, was there a, was a lot of love. I'd like to take movie, that back. It movie. wasn't the best book I wrote. It, it read, it was, it was average. <laughs> <laughs> the movie ended up having another kind of interpretation put on it, but the book comes out, and, and it took me a while to figure out what was going on, because it really, it didn't deserve the reception it got, except you could throw a book into an NFL stadium about the NFL and it would take a year for someone to read it. It's just like people who love football don't read books. And, and, and baseball is the opposite. You could throw, you know, you write the worst book about baseball and everybody in baseball will need to have a copy. Uh, it, baseball's just, you know, it's a literary culture and football's not. So that was problem number one. And the kind of person who might read a book that was a moving family drama does not want alternating chapters of football strategy. Yeah. He came yeah. home one time to our house and we, we really, people don't believe it, we really have anything to do with it. Um, the success of it and uh, all, all the financials, you know. It, we, we just weren't a part of it, which was perfect. Cause, and he said, he said, trust me, you don't want to be a part of it. And, and he, he, was, he, was, he was actually a lot smarter than, than, I, than I remembered. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, it was, it was just such a weird existence. And then... You know, then they came and asked us to write a book, and I said, "Well, if that dumbass can write. I know I can." <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't have to read it, and 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 I didn't. Yeah. Um, but you may not know this if you haven't had a New York Times bestseller. They send you these stickers, and you get to put them on your book. New York Times bestseller. Yeah, these gold stickers. So they, you know, our book was a New York Times bestseller, on the bestseller list, and so they send us these stickers, and so you know, by God, I'm putting them on every book. And, and I covered my name up just so people would actually end up reading it. And so I always, in my mind, I said, you know, Newman will never, which, which he was, I think, three times, actually, voted like the most important alumnus, and they come and do a speech and stuff like that. But if they ever did, I would have taken about a six, six of those books and stacked them really nicely in Dr. Francis's <laughs> classroom. <laughs> where the gold sticker points towards her and I'd slide them across the table and just sit there for a second, get a little awkward silence, and then finally look at her and go, bet you didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I could do the same with anyone. I mean, no, this was n neither one of us. We would have been voted equally likely to write that song. I, I, I tell people, but, in the movie, we're driving down the street. It's amazing how accurate. And our book really was a lot to tell people that Michael Lewis's book was actually accurate, even though we didn't have anything to say with it. He came home one time and says, I know where to get an Uzi if you live in Memphis. I know where to get a machine gun if you live in Memphis. He said, I need a drink. <laughs> he went into the hood. I mean, he went where you shouldn't go. And that's why I, I guess it ended up being good. But in the movie, he, we're driving down the street and Michael just you know, was starting to do so well in school. And, you know, I, my daddy was a basketball coach. I don't try to fool anybody. I am a one-trick pony. If you go outside of sports, you got me. You're, I'm, I'm going to tell you right. Don't ask me who won any of the wars. I, I tied. Everybody tied, according <laughs> to me. You know, it's just it's not, it's not my background. And so I, I, I get flashbacks. And so, you know, he, he was going to be able to practice football in the spring because he they started getting good grades, just like the movie said. And so I start going on it. But I didn't want him to stop there because to him, education was basically just a means to the next step. It wasn't, he wasn't, he didn't see the value of it internally. And I guess I probably didn't either, but you know, we're not blood related, but we thought we're right on that one, I guess. And so I'm giving him the best. I said, let me just tell you something. I went to this great school. It's called Newman School. We had 84 of us. And you know, private school kids want to go to private colleges. They want to go to Tulane. They want to go to great schools like this. And to do that, you've got to be in the top half of the class. Well, that's very important to Newman. So unfortunately, they would list the ranking in the class and give it to you, often. <laughs> and it was just not a good day. But, but, but I'm telling him, I said, so Michael, you just got to know there's someone ahead of you. 
And all you have to do is focus on that person. Don't look at number one. Look at whoever's ahead of you. And, and you can do it. That, you know, I'd look at mine and I'd go, man, I know that guy in front of me. He ain't that smart. <laughs> I think I can get him. I think, and, and so, I mean, I'm just killing it. And SJ, I guess, was eight at the time. SJ's 29 years old. He's going to get his PhD here next week and uh, next month, whatever. I mean, he, I don't know whose kid he is either. Um, and, and, but he, he would never shut up, just like the movie. And he says, Dad, great story. But since you brought up the whole ranking in your class thing, what, what was your ranking in the class? And I'm driving. My wife looks at me and says, you going to tell him? I said, I'm thinking about it. So Michael, who whatever SJ did, Michael. He said, Dad, that's a good story. I get it, too. I know where you're coming from. I got it. You know, I got it. But since, since, since SJ brought it up, what was your rank in the class? Now, my perfect daughter, who really is the most wonderful human being in America and my favorite kid, don't even, don't go, ooh. It's just the truth. <laughs> she doesn't say a word. That's why she's my favorite daughter, favorite child. And so my wife looks at me and says, you're going to have to answer this. And, and if you lie, I'm going to bust you. I don't understand that. I, I, I fully understand that. So I'm driving down the road, and I go, kids, let me just tell you something. Your dad made the top half of the class possible. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't a whole lot further up the road than me, <laughs> this one. Yeah. But he was in the top half. <laughs> I, I went and looked it up. We're going to open this up to questions, but I, want to, I have one memory. If it's, if it's interesting, I still can't figure out why, why this is interesting to people, but I'm here. So, so, <laughs> my memory, so the movie, uh, because the movie was what exploded this story in, into the American. And, and you did sell a couple books after the movie. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but not... But yeah. The, yeah. Oh, don't leave that out. No, no, no. You are, and even though you deny it, a capitalist at heart. Do I deny it? Yes, you do. I don't think you so. You hide out in Berkeley like you're not. <laughs> you leave there a lot and no, you are. No, you really need an adversary. <laughs> you can't accept that I'm not that far away from you. You are far as, as, as you could get. Um, so I just have one vivid memory of the movie, and it was, it was your reaction when, Sam, when you first got, got to see the rough cut and Sandra Bullock comes out on the screen and you went, oh, there are two of them. Two of them. <laughs> that, that that'll, she keep, was, that'll keep you up at night. That, it, that likeness was unbelievable. The, the next most important thing is when I took my life insurance and went second to die. Because I would, well, I would sleep like that when she was going to get it all. And then, <laughs> then she became famous, and I really started, both eyes open. So now I sleep a little bit better. But you know, and this, this story about American entertainment culture, because we, yep. the, this book comes out, eh, uh, it gets bought for the movies. Because for, for nothing, by for the nothing. way. And Julia Roberts. Can I tell them how much it sold for? You remind me, I don't know. $150,000. Yeah. And by the way, even though he's a jerk, he gave me half. Yeah. Now, we split it with the five kids, and I paid all their taxes, so I got nothing still. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's my point. Yeah. That's, that's actually true. You know, but it's also actually true that the people who bought it didn't make it. No, they and threw it in the garbage can. They, they, yeah, they threw it in the garbage can. They said they, and, then they, and then they confessed that what they'd really done is using it as a, they used it as a lure. They were trying to get Julia Roberts to play. Your Here's character. where I hijacked the, 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 the stage. So in, the, in, the, in our life, I was driving down the street with the family, and my wife doesn't cook, but she says if we go get it and we eat it at home, she gets to call it a home-cooked meal. So <laughs> I tell people we were day before Thanksgiving going to get a home-cooked meal. And there was Michael and, and spit in the snow, and, and he was in my daughter's class. The, the movie had him a year off. They're actually the same, same exact age. And I kind of went, oh, there's that kid. I mean, it wasn't hard to tell. They, they, they probably didn't have five African-American kids in, in the school, so it wasn't like I was some genius looking at it. And he was huge. And I'm... I was going to get a home-cooked meal. And my wife looked at me, I'll never forget it, she said, turn around. Didn't put it in a question form. I looked like Bo Duke of the, the tree. <laughs> I turned around and that, that, that's how it was. So the, the word turn around to us is sacred. 
My wife wears it on her thing. I wish I was 16, I'd get a tattoo and do it because I, I, I can't do it at 63. But if I was 16, I'd get the tattoo. I mean, it, it really is an important thing in our lives. And when a movie, 20th Century Fox, threw it in the garbage can and Alcon Pictures came and bought it out of the garbage can, that movie officially, and you people in the movie thing, world know what I'm going to, that movie is officially in this two words and it's called in turnaround. Yeah. That book, I mean, that movie became its life in turnaround. Yeah, yeah. And, so and we, we, you know, we, we, and, if, you, if you don't believe in miracles, none of this makes sense. But, and we do. But it also gets the two cultures in the country because every movie studio in Hollywood passed, up, passed on it. And it was only because your daughter was dating Fred Smith's son. And Fred Smith said, I know that story. It's a great story. I'm going to make it in a movie but I'm not gonna pay anybody. I'm gonna give everybody a stake in it. We actually had to give money back. You, yeah, you probably don't remember I don't that. Remember yeah, they said- You had to pay Fred Smith to make yeah, the movie. Yeah, yeah, they said it wasn't gonna be any good, so we, whatever they get, that's my 75, I think I had to give it back. But to it him. really, I don't know if it's the biggest grossing sports movie ever, but it's close. And it's-, it's It, it and doesn't it, match the six Rockies, but it beats any Rocky in between. That's uh, right. Individual. There you go. But, it, it, but it's, if you, in my life, it's the book, like, if I move in liberal America, or in city America, in urban America, it's the book everybody forgot I wrote. But if I am anywhere in between, it's the only book they know. Real America. Well, it's When you're in real America. There are two Americas. And it's, and, but it red, it's red and blue, yeah, that's the, it's a rough divide. Yeah. But, but it is the book that a lot of people who don't read books know. And it's a story they know. And it, it's, it's, the, it's the anomaly. Uh, and I'm good people were in charge of both. A good guy wrote the book, and an incredible guy directed and wrote the movie. And, and people ask us, how can you not be part of that? Aren't you scared? And I said, well, you know, at some point in time in life, you have to trust people. You don't get up in the car in the morning and, you know, wiggle your tires and check the battery. You know, and then you, you're going to go over a bridge. You don't stop and shake the bridge. You know, we, we all take risks every day. And we felt the risk wasn't that much because really two good people were in charge. And that way, you know, we just said, you know, God's going to take it wherever he wants to take it. And, and, and that's, unfortunately, he took it. In retrospect, the funny thing is that the person who was most uncomfortable with the whole thing was Leanne. In, that she was like, I don't want to be in public. No, she's just as uncomfortable every day. No. In the beginning, before she the movie. She hates Michael. <laughs> it's not true. She threw a glass of wine on him when he said it was, no, he doesn't, no, she really doesn't like you. You think he's so popular and famous that he thinks people like him. She's not one of them. <laughs> Trust me. She barely likes me. 42 years later, I know she doesn't. Michael says, sell this as a movie. She says, uh, no, we're not. He says, you got no choice. And she threw a glass of wine on him. Like, I'm tired of this shit, was her quote. <laughs> and I remember going, I'm picking her side, Mike. I, so, so we got time for one question. We got, we had two minutes. Does anybody want to ask a question? Because if I don't do that, I'll have violated the spirit of this thing. T, you want to ask a question? No. <laughs> Let me tell you about T. No. T was my favorite person growing up and she's still my favorite person. And when I got my first letter jacket as a freshman, I was kind of dumb and naive. She, oh, she has like 18 cousins, Dicky, Nicky, Ricky, Tricky, Dicky. They're all ickies, they're all ickies. Trust me, they're all ickies. And every icky had a letter jacket and she was the only one in the group that didn't have letters. She says, can I have your letter jacket? I said, sure. I didn't know that my girlfriend would have wanted it. That was a very uncomfortable couple months. And so I told this story in front of Sandra Bullock, your friend, and at the Super Bowl when there was in New Orleans, and we were at Commanders, of course, because we don't come here without going there. And I was telling the story about how I gave T my jacket, you know, blah, 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 blah. Ten minutes later, she comes back with the jacket and gives it to my daughter. Oh. 35 years later, <laughs> that's who she is right there. That's true. All right. We're going to end it on that note. Thank you very much.